watch I had nine o'clock. I'd like to call this hearing to order. Good morning. I'm Nancy J. Shabazz, Chair of the uh, Environmental Appeals Board. The purpose of today's proceeding is to commence with the hearing and consideration of the appeal filed on June 14, 2013, by the Sierra Club and Delaware Audubon against the State of Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control regarding um, Secretary Colin Amara's issuance of Secretary's Order 2013-A-0020, dated May 31, 2013. This matter has been docketed as Appeal Number 2013-06. I'd first like to introduce the board members and a few other individuals. Uh, Mr. Gordon Wood, Mr. Sebastian Maraca, Mr. Michael Horsey, Mr. Andrew Aronson, Mr. Dean Holden, uh, our Deputy Attorney General and Board Counsel, uh, Frank Burgess, and our Board Assistant, Administrative Assistant, Gail Henderson. Thank you, Gail, for pulling this together. <laughs> Nancy, the microphone will go. Uh, next, some housekeeping items. Please turn off all cell phones and set them to vibrate mode. Or, I'm sorry, or set them to vibrate mode. If you put your phone on vibrate and receive a call, please leave the auditorium before beginning your conversation. Today's hearing will conclude no later than 4.30. We will be taking an hour break for lunch at noon and possibly a mid-morning and mid-afternoon break. Notwithstanding the schedule and as circumstances warrant, the board may deliberate at any time and will do so in executive session pursuant to its authority under 7 Delaware Code, Section 008, Subsection A. For purposes of this introduction and any questions and discussions throughout this proceeding, the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control and the Delaware City Refining Company, LLC, may be referred to as DENREC and DCRC, respectively. Public notice of today's hearing was posted on the State of Delaware Secretary of State's public meeting calendar, website, and at um, the Richardson and Robbins Building, 89 Kings Highway, which is the location of this hearing today in Dover. <clears throat> in addition, public notice of this hearing was published in the news journal and in the Delaware State News. As I just noted, the matter before the board this morning is an appeal filed by the Sierra Club and Delaware Audubon. The appeal opposes Denrick's Secretary's Order Number 2013-A-0020, which authorized the issuance of an amended air pollution control permit to DCRC and for DCRC's marine vapor recovery system at its, control, at its petroleum refinery and docking facility in Delaware City. Specifically, the appeal challenges the Secretary's decision with respect to the applicability of the Coastal Zone Act to DCRC's proposed use under the amended air permit, which is the transfer of crude oil to vessels for shipment offsite. The relief sought by the appeal is stated on page 7 thereof, excuse me, 7 thereof, is that I, is that, and I quote, the order should be reversed or remanded with instructions to DENREC to comply with the Coastal Zone Act and its implementing regulations. Subsequent to the filing of this appeal, the permit applicant, DCRC, <coughs> DCRC, filed a motion to intervene in this matter. This motion was not opposed by the appellant Sierra Club and Audubon, and Delaware Audubon, or by DENREC. Accordingly, I entered in an order on September 25, 2013, granting DCRC's motion to join this matter as an intervener. Also with respect to DCRC, both Bart Cassidy and Catherine Bocaro from the Pennsylvania law firm of Mango, Gold, Catcher, and Fox have been admitted pro hoc vice in accordance with Delaware Supreme Court Rule 72 and represent DCRC in this matter. By agreement of the parties, today's hearing is not an evidentiary hearing on the merits of the appeal. Prior to today's hearing, the parties, including DCRC, entered into a stipulation regarding the filing of motions to dismiss. A briefing schedule on those motions, as well as proposed hearing dates. In, in according with that stipulation, both DENREC and DCRC filed motions to dismiss this appeal for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. And the parties submitted their respective briefs, all of which have been distributed to the board in advance of this hearing. In addition, according to the appellant's answering brief, 
appellants are, re are requesting that this matter be stayed. Both DENREC and DR DCRC, as argued in their respective reply briefs, oppose a stay. All parties agree that today is proceeding to legal arguments with respect to motions to dismiss. In addition, the board may also consider a motion to stay. If the motions to dismiss are not granted, or the matter is not stayed, a hearing on the merits of the appeal will commence next Tuesday, January 21st, 2013, at this location beginning at 9 a.m., unless the parties agree to a later date for such hearing. Finally, as a general point of information for the parties and anyone else in attendance, please be advised that the board is a quasi-judicial review board created by the General Assembly to hear appeals of decisions of the DENREC Secretary. The matter in which the board fulfills its duties and responsibilities, in, <coughs> including conducting its hearings, is established and governed by the Delaware Code, by the board's regulations, and by case law in some respects. The board is required to, to issue its written decision within 90 days of the conclusion of this matter. Pursuant to 7 Delaware Code section 6009, subsection A, any person or persons, jointly or severally, or any taxpayer or any officer, department, board, or bureau of the state, aggrieved by any decision of the board, may appeal to the Superior Court within 30 days of the receipt of the written opinion of the board. Specific appeal requirements are set forth in the Delaware Code and in the board's regulations. So, before we begin the arguments, do any of the parties have any questions regarding the information I just provided? Thank you. Mr. Crystal, um, since um, uh, this is your appeal, would you like to provide an overview of um, the nature of the appeal without arguing the merits and explain the Coastal Zone Industrial uh, Control Board regulations? Uh, certainly, I'd be happy. Or proceeding. To, I'm sorry, proceeding. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to do that, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the board, I'm Kenneth Crystal uh, from the Widener University Environmental Law Clinic, uh, and I represent the appellants in this matter. Uh, this case is an appeal of the Secretary's order, as the Chair indicated, uh, which granted an amendment to an air permit governing the marine vapor recovery system on the dock at the Delaware City Refinery. I don't know if it's okay. Uh, at the time that the order was issued, uh, the order discussed not just compliance with uh, various provisions of the regulations and the statute relating to an air permit. There also was an extensive discussion of whether or not the facility was required a Coastal Zone Act permit and what the status of the facility was under the Coastal Zone Act. That was in response to comments that were made uh, by my clients during the public comment process uh, on the permits. We appealed simultaneously both to this board and to the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board uh, because it was our contention that this secretary's order was both a the functional equivalent of what is called a status decision under the Coastal Zone Act, thereby triggering the jurisdiction of the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board. And it was also an air permit, which is appealable to this board. Because of the statutory requirement under the Coastal Zone Act that the uh, the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board must conduct a hearing within and reach a decision within 60 days of the filing of an appeal. A hearing was held uh, back in July, on July 17, uh, before that board. And at that hearing, uh, both the refinery and DENREC argued for dismissal of the action on the basis of a lack of jurisdiction by the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, as well as a lack of standing. Those motions were uh, not granted initially. A hearing was held. And after the close of evidence in that hearing, uh, the board voted seven to nothing that the appellants lacked standing before that board and dismissed the appeal at that time. 
subsequent to the board's written decision on August 12th, uh, we filed an appeal with the Superior Court uh, of the board's decision on standing. And so that, I believe, is, is sort of what happened. Uh, it is a concise summary, and, and certainly counsel for the refinery or for DENREC can, can correct me if I'm wrong. But that's what happened before the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, and now we are here on the air permit side uh, and our appeal based on that. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Uh, Madam Chair and the Board, we would dispute the characterization of Mr. Crystal of what the Secretary's order does relative to the Coastal Zone issues, but procedurally we don't disagree with his characterization of the proceeding before the Coastal Zone Board and where that stands at this time. Apologize. Uh, my name is Bart Cassidy on behalf of uh, the refinery, Delaware City Refining Company. Okay. So uh, you all have met and uh, we've and agreed on a procedure, a process that we're going to follow today. Um, so I'm asking that your arguments be limited. Sorry, Max Walton, for the record, I'll go first. <laughs> Max Walton, on behalf of Secretary Amara and Denrec, and thank, I thank the board for meeting off schedule today. Sorry. I'd like to add one thing. I thank everybody for making sure the schedules were um, freed up to have this hearing today. Mm -hmm. I know the weather. Chair, members of the board, what's at stake here is whether the EAB is board will for the first time take an unprecedented step of taking jurisdiction over matters that arise solely under the Coastal Zone Act. In Denrex's view, uh, under all three decisions in the Ocean Port case, and under the plain language and the statutory scheme in Title VII, the board lacks jurisdiction to hear CZA issues. And I'd like to set the stage about what this appeal involves, and I believe Mr. Crystal said it, and I just want to emphasize it. While this appeal involves an air permit, um, the issues to be decided, or that they're asking this board to decide, uh, rest solely under the Coastal Zone Act. And if you actually go take a look at the appeal that was filed, it says that the appellants, and I quote, are challenging only the portions of the order I mean the Secretary's order, in which the Secretary ruled on the status of the crude oil transfer operation under the Coastal Zone Act. So while this is an air permit appeal, there are no traditional air permit issues that are being, that are being decided. And the, so I'm going to start off and, and discuss Ocean Board. I think that's where this case really should focus, because this board, the Superior Court, and the Supreme Court already uh, addressed uh, jurisdiction in those cases. So let, let's set the stage. In Oceanport, the Secretary granted an air discharge permit, a discharge permit for stormwater, uh, a dip-dees permit, and a permit for peer improvement relating to the Paragon Dock, which was essentially the Texaco facility before that. And Wilmington Stevedores was the appellant, and they were a competing business. And they, they took the appeal and they claimed that the proposed activity uh, that was occurring violated the Coastal Zone Act. So even though the, the permits that they were appealing uh, came to this board generally, the, the appeal itself dealt with Coastal Zone Act issues. And Wilmington Stevedores ultimately, their main grade was that there was the project that was actually being built uh, for. Ocean Port was different than that which was uh, represented in a coastal zone status decision some four years before. To, so to set the stage, uh, this board first heard the question of whether or not Wilmington Steve Doors could bring that claim and whether or not this board had jurisdiction uh, to hear the appeal of Coastal Zone Act issues. And this board held, and I quote, the entire thrust of the WSI, e.g. the Wilmington Steve Doors 
clearly indicates that the complaint belongs before the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board and not the board. So this board held that it could not hear CTA issues. And that is a material on binding holding of this board, which is precedent. Wellington Stevedores then thereafter appealed that decision uh, to the Superior Court. And that's where it got a little funny, so I'm going to try to help you walk the truth of the Superior Court decision, which is in our appendix of documents. If you look at what the Superior Court ruled with respect to the board's jurisdiction, the, the Superior Court also held that the Coastal Zone Act issues could not be heard by this board. And if you look at what the Superior Court stated, they say, quote, quite naturally, uh, the EAB, uh, and I quote again, considers it beyond the scope of its authority to uh, review the CZA determination. So the Superior Court also recognized uh, that this board didn't have jurisdiction. The funny, the, the funny part about the Superior Court uh, opinion, or the sort of the anomaly in that Superior Court opinion, was that the, the Superior Court reversed a portion of the order, and, they, and the Superior Court remanded the CZA issues back to this board, with direction to then remand it back to the Secretary to consider CZA issues. So if you understand how that played out, um, but uh, I want to make it very clear, at no time the Superior Court even hint that the EAB had jurisdiction over the Coastal Zone Act, not one. Um, following uh, that Superior Court decision, there was an interlocutory appeal filed to the Delaware Supreme Court, sort of a special appeal before uh, a matter is final. And the Supreme Court held that this board got it right on the EAB held the EAB didn't have jurisdiction here because of some kind of issues. All right. One of the issues, one of the two issues certified was whether the Superior Court uh, confused the application of the Coastal Zone Act when remanding questions, uh, uh, Coastal Zone Act questions, back to this board for further remand to the Secretary. And the Supreme Court held that when the Superior Court remanded the questions to this board, Go back to the uh, to go back to the secretary under the Coastal Zone Act. It was quote an erroneous regarding a determination of ocean port CTA status. Right? The court in that case made the same claim that we're making here with respect to jurisdiction. That they, the court made expressly clear that the CZA in Chapter 60, which is the statute normally uh, that this board uh, deals with has, quote, different purposes and requirements. And the court was very clear that if a board has jurisdiction for Coastal Zone Act issues, it's the Coastal Zone Board that handles it under 7 Delaware Code 7007. The important point of that Superior Court opinion is that, or excuse me, the Supreme Court opinion is that the Supreme Court said that even a slight involvement uh, by sending the matter back to the EAB for further remand to the superior, or for further remand to the secretary, directing the secretary to review the project was beyond this board's jurisdiction to do. You couldn't even send it back to the secretary to review it. They couldn't even send it back to the secretary to review it because this Coastal Zone Act is beyond this board's authority. So, so what are what are you being asked to do? You're being asked to be dragged in far deeper than um, what the Supreme Court said was improper for the Ocean Court. And you're being asked to actually hear and decide Coastal Zone Act decisions and solely Coastal Zone Act questions, excuse me, um, for the first time ever. The bottom line is that if you go to Ocean Court, uh, go to Ocean Court, you follow the press along this board, the Supreme, the Superior Court, and the Superior Court and the Supreme Court have all previously held that the EAB can't hear appeals of CZA issues, and that precedent should not be disturbed. And I would also like to say um, there is not another single case which has been cited by the appellants which hold that this, that this board can hear Coastal Zone Act issues or issues arising, in their words, solely under, uh, under the Coastal Zone Act. So, 
thought, I think Ocean Port's the controlling statute, or the controlling cases, but let's, let's look at why the Supreme Court and this board held that the EAB doesn't have jurisdiction to over code on that issues. It's simple. It's because of the statutory scheme. It's very well settled in Delaware that a party doesn't have a right to an appeal unless the statute governing the matter has conferred the right to do so. Very plain. There is not a single provision in the Coastal Zone Act, Chapter 70, that expressly states that the EAB has jurisdiction over Coastal Zone Act issues. Not one. You've got to go to 7005 of Title 7, which establishes and provides the appeal for the Coastal Zone Board. So first, without there being a statute expressly conferring jurisdiction on this board, you do not have jurisdiction to hear the matter. And the question has been raised, well, well maybe they don't have to. And, and if you go back through the, the statutes, and you look at the statutory scheme overall as a whole, where the General Assembly has wanted to confer jurisdiction on this board, they've expressly done it. And you guys know the jurisdictional end of this better than I do. But if you look at I mean, just a few examples, uh, of course you have Chapter 60. You also have Chapter 72, where you have an appeal, so they base land uh, act. Chapter 62, dealing with pollution, uh, oil pollution liability. Chapter 74, underground tanks. 74A, above ground tanks. Chapter 91, hazardous substance cleanup act. These are all examples of where when the General Assembly wanted you, this board, to have jurisdiction, they said it. And if they wanted you to have jurisdiction under the Coastal Zone Act, they would have said so. But they did. So, how do the appellants attempt to get around uh, that, that plain fact that there's no express jurisdiction? The slender reed uh, upon which they attempt to escape the statute and the ocean port fully is the phrase, any action of the secretary, in section 6008 of chapter 60. And, and that statute, any action of the secretary, uh, in order to interpret that, you have to look at the entire statutory scheme of the Environmental Control Act, or chapter 60, all right? And you can't view that language in isolation. So, so what did the General Assembly mean? the intent of the General Assembly when it adopted 6008. We look at the statutes around it. And I see if you look at uh, 6002, um, it defines, excuse me, 6002, it says the defined terms are as they're used in this chapter. And if you go to 6005 of the statute, it says the secretary shall enforce this chapter. So if you go through those steps, it's very clear that the any action of the secretary, 6008 language, relates to the chapter that it's in. It just makes sense. Any action of the secretary in this act that we are uh, adopting under, under, um, excuse me, under the Environmental Control Act in 1973 and under uh, chapter 60 as a whole. But let's take the next step. If 6008 conferred jurisdiction for uh, Coastal Zone Act's claims, it would create a very absurd result. It just doesn't make sense. If you think about it, if any action of the Secretary can be appealed, Coastal Zone Act or otherwise, all right, there would be jurisdiction in both boards because any action of the Secretary could be appealed here and any and the, under the 7005 and the Coastal Zone Statutes, the appeal could go there. And the, that would allow parties, if they wanted, to appeal to this board and completely bypass the Coastal Zone uh, Board, if they so choose, because they would have an appeal right here. Another absurd result that would occur is if the EAB actually had jurisdiction over coastal zone actions, parties could appeal to both boards. And there would be, you could have two hearings on exactly the same matter before two different administrative boards. Not only is that duplicative of the state's resources uh, and of the time of the members of the boards involved, uh, it also creates the risk of inconsistent decisions. It just doesn't 
any sense. And it's contrary, 180 degrees contrary to the intent of the General Assembly to set up the Coastal Zone Board to hear appeals of Coastal Zone Act issues and appoint members with specialized expertise to also give jurisdiction to the EAB. And if you think about it, you have a very specialized expertise, this board does, because you have matters under Chapter 60, and you hear specific statutes. And the Coastal Zone Board has its own specific and important and specialized skill. That's why they have planners and members of economic development on, on that board, because it's much more of a land use statute um, than, than otherwise. So the, the other point uh, that appellants raise, uh, the other statute they raise, is Regulation 11.6, which requires generally compliance with statutes. And they say, well, if you look at 11.6, we have jurisdiction here. But actually, a regulation, and we cited the, the case, uh, we cited the provision in our brief, a regulation by itself can't grant jurisdiction. Only the General Assembly can do so. Regulations cannot make or, amend, or cannot amend requirements that are set forth in a statute. But even if you look at, at Regulation 11.6, by its plain language, it's not even directed to jurisdiction of its board. So, um, boiled down, boiled down, let's deal with what the claim really is. Appellants claim that if this Coastal Zone Act doesn't have jurisdiction, the EAB must. But that's not true, as the statute has to say. And if this board doesn't have uh, jurisdiction under the relevant statutes, as a creature of statute uh, by itself, this board can't hear the issues. And if you think back to where I started, it's exactly what Ocean Port held. No jurisdiction was found in the Ocean Port case, and the same result should follow here. I'd like to speak just very, very briefly uh, about the stay request. And uh, while Madam Chair's uh, statement uh, was true regarding the stay, um, and I would like to further expand on why, why uh, we don't think a stay is appropriate. Jurisdiction is a threshold issue, and we cited the General Electric case and the Bruno case. Um, and, if, and you have to decide the first in the first instance whether or not you have jurisdiction. To, so to stay without actually having jurisdiction doesn't make sense because we need to decide that issue whether or not you have jurisdiction, and then whether or not you have the discretion to stay. Um, in conclusion. For the board to find jurisdiction in this case, you have to ignore the, the prior um, the prior precedent of this board and the Delaware Supreme Court from Ocean Court. You have to read section 600 and 8 in a manner in which the General Assembly did not intend. Um, and so ultimately, because the appellant's claims are only under the Coastal Zone Act and no statute expressly confers jurisdiction on this board, Appeals should be dismissed. And again, motion board controls. Now, I know I had an hour to give my presentation, and I don't take it because I don't. You have the, our briefs, and if there was a question that you had from our briefs, I try to just focus on what I think is are, are the high points. But if there are any questions, we'll, we'll rest on our papers for the remainder of the arguments. Any board members have questions? Question. Mm -hmm. With respect to the only action of the secretary, you say that relates only to the environmental control. But is that stated anywhere in what you mentioned? Okay, it says any action of the secretary in 6008. And my contention is you have to look at 6005 and 6002. And you actually have to look at the act itself when it was adopted. If you look at the act in total, as any action of the secretary back in 73. But what's the intent? And what I'm trying to say is, what is the intent of that statute? Because under the applicable case law, you look at what the intent of the General Assembly was. If you look at 6005, I think the intent is pretty clear. The secretary shall enforce this chapter. So when the secretary enforces the chapter under 6005, under 6008, then any action of the secretary can be appealed. It's any action of the secretary within six years.
Chair, members of the board, my name is Bart Cassidy. I represent the permittee, in this case, Delaware City Refining Company. And I'm here today to request that this board grant our pending motion to dismiss this action for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Since Mr. Walton has comprehensively and effectively addressed the primary reasons in support of our motions to dismiss, I don't want to spend significant time to repeat those issues. Uh, I will actually, as, as Mr. Walton requests, that I reserve a significant portion of my time for rebuttal. I do want to emphasize a few points, however. Uh, when we as lawyers deal with issues before tribunals, we often have to deal with apparent inconsistencies between analysis of details, broader perspectives and objectives, and established precedent. It's fairly rare we get to argue cases where all three of those things line up. Uh, Mr. Walton has stepped through a lot of the detail and a lot of the precedent, and so again, I'm not going to get into that in great uh, detail. I want to focus much more on some of the bigger picture issues. It is undisputed, um, both in the statements in the appeals, the statements raised by the chair in describing this case, and Mr. Crystal's description, that at issue here is solely the interpretation of the Coastal Zone Act. And what is also undisputed is that appellants have sought to raise those arguments before the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, which they directly state they believe to be the right board, and they see this tribunal as a backstop. In the event that they don't have the opportunity to pursue those issues fully before the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, they want the chance to be able to pursue those same issues here. We think that that completely ignores the law and completely disregards the appropriate role of this body as Mr. Walton has already pointed out, the concept of jurisdiction is fundamental. This board and any tribunal has the obligation to make a determination before it considers any issue of dispute as to whether it has the legal authority to resolve it. Had there been no motions to dismiss pending before you, you would face that exact same issue. It is also well-established law that any party seeking to call upon the jurisdiction of a body bears the burden of demonstrating that it exists. There is no presumption of jurisdiction before any tribunal. In this circumstance, we deal with the fact that in Delaware, the legislature has very specifically and with clear intent established two distinct boards for the purposes of resolving different types of challenges. Each of those boards has specific expertise. So when we look at the broader principles that we're trying to address in this issue, while all the details line up in support of how jurisdiction falls and how the statute should be interpreted, the bigger picture issues are, the legislature's already said, we've got some specific issues that arise under this body of law, and we want a specific board with certain expertise to resolve it, to the extent that there is an opportunity for that issue to be heard. We have other issues that may resolve from other actions of the secretary, and we've created a distinct board for that purpose. And we want to make sure we're calling upon their expertise when appropriate. The idea of resolving these jurisdictional questions is not only important as a point of law, and it is critically important as a point of law. It's also very important from the practical implications of what otherwise flows from it. And that's partly why I started as I did in framing what the circumstances are for this appeal. If the situation arises such that, in essence, there are multiple options that might be pursued 
for any given challenge. It's quite clear what challenges and obstacles and problems can flow from that. One of the things that we always seek to be able to establish by way of implementation of any law is to avoid a condition in which the form that is ultimately pursued by the appellant dictates a distinct outcome. There's no concept of uh, certainty in law and, and having a basis to believe that the intention of the underlying legal scheme will be realized if, in essence, the determination in a given circumstance depends entirely upon which particular form a given body has the option of seeking to have a review of their challenges in a specific case. As Mr. Walton has already said, and we can talk about Oceanport, and I don't want to get nearly into the detail that he and our briefs get into, but there's a couple of key points there. One of the things that the Supreme Court unequivocally was clear on, and I don't think there can be any dispute, quote right out of the case, no party has a right to appeal unless the statute governing the matter has conferred a right to do so. Given that circumstance, the idea that if the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board does not have jurisdiction or otherwise does not consider this case, there is an opportunity for another board, and indeed must be an opportunity for another entity to do so, is directly inconsistent with that concept. As Mr. Walton points out, in order to try to find a basis for jurisdiction, appellants look to two issues, and I do want to spend a few more minutes on this concept of the language out of uh, the statute that talks about any action of the Secretary. Um, and to specifically Mr. Larosa's question. I think that the real key issue that we need to look at is there are both legal and practical considerations as to why that statutory provision cannot and should not be interpreted in the manner that Mr. Crystal suggests. First, the concept of jurisdiction involves two elements. First, there must be some action of the administrative agency, in this case the Secretary of the Department, that falls within the scope of the jurisdictional grant uh, over which the tribunal, in this case this board, may have jurisdiction. But second, the substance of the challenge likewise must fall within the scope of that jurisdictional grant. For the very reason that, in a given circumstance, the secretary will take certain actions, such as issuing an air permit. Under the basic concepts of the statute, a challenge to an air permit falls within the scope of the type of actions that the agency takes, the appeal of which may be raised before this board. But once you get past that initial threshold point of the idea that the action has triggered a right of appeal, does not mean that anything anybody wants to argue falls within the scope of, this, of the jurisdiction of this board. The substantive issues that are to be raised must also fall within the scope of the jurisdiction created by the statute. Further as to the legal issues, Mr. Crystal argues in his brief that the subsequent statutes, the specific ones that address this board's jurisdiction, expressly speak to and confer upon this board jurisdiction as it relates to the subject matter of that statute. So Mr. Crystal argues, doesn't that necessarily mean that when the legislature wanted to limit the jurisdictional grant, it does so expressly? It's exactly the opposite. If the environmental control statute granted to this board the jurisdiction to consider any action by the secretary, boundless, why would there ever be a need in a subsequent environmental statute for the same legislature to say, oh, and by the way, you have jurisdiction to consider this specific issue in this statute? And that's the necessary implication of all those subsequent statutes is that each one, like the environmental control statute that came before it, deals with the jurisdictional grant within the bounds of the substance of the statute itself. Those statutes would have been, the, the provisions of those statutes would have been completely unnecessary and inappropriate, as we call it surplusage, um, if that was the appropriate interpretation of the environmental control statute. And one of the principal provisions of interpreting a statute is you do not presume that the legislature has thrown in unnecessary language, let alone again and again and again with respect to subsequent environmental statutes. Also, Mr. Crystal's argument relies heavily on the idea that the Coastal Zone Act was in place when the environmental control statute was written. And certainly then, the legislature must have recognized that when they said any action of the secretary without limitation, that would seem to have the effect of sweeping the Coastal Zone interpretation in as well. But at the time the environmental control statute was written, 
the Coastal Zone Act was not administered by the Secretary. There would have been no reason, indeed it would have been counter to the implementation of that statute for the Environmental Control Statute to say, but we don't mean the Coastal Zone Act. There was no purpose for it. There's also the practical considerations here, which is why, as I started, it lines up for us in all fronts in this circumstance. When we step back for a moment to look at this issue, the idea that by virtue of that provision of Section 6008, this board would be a forum for considering any action of the Secretary. And specifically to quote the brief filed by Mr. Crystal, and that means anything the Secretary can do. The extent and breadth of what that implication is is absolutely boundless. It eliminates the fundamental premise of what jurisdiction is supposed to be in the first instance, and also ends up eliminating the idea and the importance of the specialized nature of a board of this sort. Your expertise is not to be drawn upon about anything somebody might happen to want to argue before you simply because the secretary acted in some regard. We could all sit here all day and think about the extreme examples of what that might involve. And there is another principle of statutory construction that we deal with all of the time. And it's one of the ones that rarely do we lawyers get something that seems to make sense to everybody, but this one does. And that is you don't interpret a statute in a way that leads to absurd results. Lots of cases that say that. There's a key point in looking at what a statute means. You have to give it an interpretation that makes sense. And the idea that it makes sense to allow anything the secretary might happen to do without bound to be a basis for a challenge before this board can't possibly be justified and supported. The second argument, again, as Mr. Walton points out, raised by appellants to try to find a basis for jurisdiction is this regulatory concept out of 11.6, uh, and that comes out of the regulations promulgated under the Environmental Control Statute. Again, just to emphasize, a regulation cannot be the basis to establish jurisdiction of a tribunal. Otherwise, agencies would have the ability to write regs and dictate who gets to hear what issue as they would seem most effective and appropriate. Uh, in addition, just like the discussion we had about the Coastal Zone Act and the Environmental Control Statute, when this regulation was promulgated, it was at a time in which the uh, Secretary was not implementing the Coastal Zone Act. So the language of the rule would not have had a basis to consider implementation of that statute. But it also is very important to look at the implications of the argument and the interpretation again. This is a regulation that comes within the context of the department's requirements for what needs to be included in a permit application. That's the section of the rules that comes in. And it defines what issues an applicant needs to address. What the rules say is, understand applicant, that the department is not gonna issue a permit if it's inconsistent with other uh, programs that the department addresses. And that must be addressed in the application. Does the secretary, should the secretary then look at the scope and bounds of what that means as part of the process? Absolutely. But what appellants seek to do here is to say, number one, that this is a necessary part of the permit process. Number two, in our argument, it should include the Coastal Zone Act. And then number three, whatever you think about that second step, number three, the huge leap. And so therefore, because of that provision, anything that implicates the Coastal Zone Act without bound, or any other statute for that matter that's impl uh, implemented by the Department and the Secretary, falls within the scope of an issue that may be raised for argument before this board. You know, it's the proverbial concept of trying to get my toe in the door so I can blast it wide open, that there's some idea that there is a regulatory step in the process, even to the extent that it would extend to the Coastal Zone Act, that creates complete, free, and open opportunity to raise every issue under the Coastal Zone Act without bound. Uh, the implications of these issues have to be looked at relative to this case and all cases that come after. I know the board appreciates that in resolving a question like jurisdiction for an entire statutory scheme, yes, it is critically important to the refinery and these issues, but it will dictate things that come hereafter. It is very important for all that follow. The idea that a given project that might implicate an air permit, subaqueous lands permit, any specific permit action that's clearly within the scope of this board's review may also implicate coastal zone issues. This isn't surprising. Uh, this happens all the time. And so in a circumstance in which a given project may require a coastal zone permit and an environmental permit such as an air permit, under repellent's read, 
really up to the appellants in the first instance to decide, what if I want to resolve that coastal zone issue? Do I want to go to this board and raise the argument as a regulatory issue as part of the air permitting process, or do I think I'm going to do better if I go before the coastal zone board? And do I really even get the choice, or is it instead dictated by timing circumstance? Yes, it is the case that the coastal zone board's timing is more limited than yours, and so most of the time those issues will probably find their way to the coastal zone board first, if filed there so, uh, simultaneously. But look at a situation like the one we're in right here. There are circumstances in which the action may play before the coastal zone board in some capacity, but the issue isn't resolved, even as to jurisdiction, or even if the coastal zone board had made a jurisdictional determination, it can be brought up on appeal to the superior court thereafter. And what is this board then intended to do? There is nothing that appellants can identify in the statute, in case law, in any scheme that would suggest that this board's jurisdiction is dependent upon what's happening with the separate board. Or you're left now with a circumstance where you necessarily always have to wait in the city, or now part of your requirement is for you to decide what the Coastal Zone Board's jurisdiction is and for you to decide whether or not that issue should arise for purposes of their authority or yours. The important premise here in the first instance, however, is it can be neither. There's this concept, and we all get it when we watch you know, lots of television about law, that I want my day in court. And there's a, a basic idea that lots of people have that anything I want to argue, I have a chance to get my day before some forum. Sorry, but as a legal premise, that is clearly unequivocally wrong. The opportunities to have a chance to argue a legal issue are described and bounded by specific legal schemes. As has been stated consistently by the courts, by reflecting in the briefs, the opportunity to raise an issue has to specifically be conferred by statute or by constitution. If it's not there, it's not there. If it means that a given issue can't be raised before any tribunal, that's what it means. And that play is exactly here. If there had not been an air permit in this case, and there were no air issues being challenged in this case, the reality is, the record reflects, the air permit allowed for some minor modifications to instrumentation and piping, um, and achieved some significant reductions in the allowable emission rates. But there's a fine argument that says, in other circumstances, no air permit would have been necessary for this action at all. And in the absence of that air permit action, what would be the basis to be even asserting a claim before this board? There's no difference in the coastal zone issues that appellants seek to raise. The only issue is they're seeking to use the vehicle of a separate action dealing with an air permitting issue to get in front of this board and say, we'd like to raise these other issues that really aren't within the bounds of their expertise. But because a regulation says the secretary should at least consider consistency, we can argue anything we want over that topic. Oceanport um, is a very complex case. And there can be lots of arguments around exactly what did Oceanport resolve, and how did it resolve it, and what did it rely upon in making that decision. We feel very strongly, and we think the language of the case is very clear, that the Supreme Court of Delaware expressly addressed the question as to whether or not this board has jurisdictions to consider Coastal Zone Act issues. There's a whole separate part of the opinion, Roman numeral three, dedicated to that issue alone. Uh, and the court says expressly what it is doing in that context. But you know what? It really isn't critical. Because the idea that if there's any doubt in any of your minds about whether Ocean Port ultimately resolves the case on jurisdictional grounds or not, the language of the court is unequivocal. The language of the court clearly expresses the court's view about where coastal zone issues need to come up and where they can't. This is the Supreme Court. The suggestion that if there's some doubt as to whether or not this is controlling as a specific holding of the court dictates whether this board should pay any attention to it, when it's the only basis for discussion of this type of issue from the courts within the, uh, within the state at a significant level, is completely unsupportable. And so our view on this is, we think it's really clear, the court's really clear, they made a decision based on jurisdiction, and we can talk about it in the briefs exactly why, but again, that is not the critical point. The critical point is the analysis the court gives to the issue. 
Finally, I do want to spend just a few moments uh, because in their brief, appellants suggest that the refinery has taken inconsistent positions before the two boards in trying to justify in a given forum where they'd like the issue to come out and take a different position to do so. That is a complete oversimplification and mischaracterization of our position. And let me be exceedingly clear about our position. What we argue before the Coastal Zone Board and continue to argue is that the Coastal Zone Board did not have jurisdiction because the Secretary did not take a specific action pursuant to Section 7005 and 7007 of the Coastal Zone Act that falls within the type of action that the Coastal Zone Board is able to consider. As you recall, as I pointed out earlier, there's two requirements for the jurisdiction. The action that is taken must fall within the bounds of the type of thing that the board can consider, and the substance of the challenge being raised must also fall within that scope. As to the Coastal Zone Board, it was the absence of the action. There was no permit decision. There was no status decision. And in the absence of those things, the Coastal Zone Board didn't have jurisdiction. Not because the substance of the issues being raised weren't within the scope. The action wasn't. The reverse is true here. The Secretary took an action on an air permit. An air permit challenge is typically within the scope of this board's jurisdiction. But once the argument and the substance of that challenge goes into analyses that are totally requiring interpretation of the Coastal Zone Act, the substance of the challenge is no longer within the scope of the jurisdiction. Those arguments and analyses are entirely consistent. There are two different reasons why both boards don't have jurisdiction. There's nothing about that that says, how can you argue, as a poem suggests we are, before you, that this matter should be before the Coastal Zone Board. That's not what we're arguing. What we're arguing is, if the legislature has created an opportunity, a forum, given the action at issue, for a board to consider issues under the Coastal Zone Act, it necessarily comes before the Coastal Zone Board. That doesn't mean, by implication, that there has to be an opportunity before the Coastal Zone Board. It means that if there is one, that's where it belongs. There isn't one in this circumstance because as we described what the actions were and were not in that circumstance. Uh, but that has no bearing on this board's jurisdiction and it goes to the same point I made earlier. This board's jurisdiction can't depend on whether or not the Coastal Zone Board has jurisdiction or not. And then let's finish with the final point of where that all comes together. So under that analysis and reflecting and recognizing those two distinct elements of jurisdiction, what appellant's argument comes down to is if there is an action, clearly the department secretary has made a decision on issuing a permit or has issued a status decision. Well, now we have the action that allows the Coastal Zone Board to exercise its jurisdiction because the legislature decided, Coastal Zone Board, we don't want you taking up any issue, any argument under the Coastal Zone Act that might come up. That's not what we think warrants consideration. It's only under the circumstances where the permit decision has been made and a status decision has been made. Well, under appellant's argument, if those things weren't done, and it didn't even rise to the level where the legislature felt the Coastal Zone Board should be considering those issues, they should fall to you. Because now we don't have the action, and it's the same set, same suite of expertise, same interpretation of the same statute, but because we didn't have the action that gave rise to a Coastal Zone Board's uh, jurisdictional grant, then we'll have this other board who doesn't have that background, doesn't typically interpret that statute, we'll have them interpret under that narrow circumstance. Ultimately, appellant's argument comes down to an attempt to minimize the scope of Ocean Board and seek to have you not pay any attention to it, to ignore decades of precedent, to look at the statutory language of something like any action of the secretary and say it has no bounds, and to basically seek to have this board be the backstop for coastal zone issues that can't be raised before the coastal zone board creating not only all manner of uncertainty of exactly how and when under what circumstances the issue should be decided. Instead, jurisdictional concepts are very clear under the law. Ocean Port's discussion is right on point, whether you regard it as ultimately controlling or not as a matter of law. And well-established precedent and interpretation of these programs together dictate the only reasonable outcome, which is that this board does not now take upon itself interpretation of Coastal Zone Act issues beyond jurisdiction and not properly before. Appreciate the opportunity to make these opening comments. I'm happy to answer any questions now, uh, but again, I would appreciate the opportunity to uh, have rebuttal time after.
two ways. One, when you say, if this was an appeal of an air permit, we're the right group. Uh, my point, and I think the law is very clear on this, if this is an appeal of an air permit that raises issues for consideration that fall within the environmental control statute, you're the right group. This is an attempt at an appeal of an air permit. That's just not sufficient. As to your second part of your question, who takes uh, control of those issues or who has jurisdiction, if it is a circumstance in which someone seeks to challenge a coastal zone issue. They want to make an argument under the Coastal Zone Act. But the Secretary has neither issued a permit, or made a permit decision, I should say, nor made a status decision about the applicability of the Coastal Zone Act. The answer is no. There is not a body that can take that challenge. And that, while it may feel uncomfortable on a certain level, is clear under the law that that happens all the time. Because the legislature said, when they, and, and you know, separately before the Coastal Zone Board, Mr. Crystal and I, disagree with this, and that's fine. Our interpretation is the legislature said when, when they enacted the Coastal Zone Act, Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, you're the forum to hear these issues, but you're only to hear these issues when the secretary takes certain actions. So you have two implications that flow from that. Either that means if the secretary hasn't taken these actions, there isn't an appropriate forum to raise the issue, which we believe is exactly the right answer. or when the secretary hasn't taken those actions, but you still have something you want to argue about the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Act, go somewhere else. And the point becomes, in order to go somewhere else, there has to be a statutory grant to allow you to do that. And there isn't. There is no other form. Does that mean they bypass us and the Coastal Zone Board and go straight to Superior Court, or they just have no appealable rights? Our argument is they don't have the opportunity to go to Superior Court either, because this is not a circumstance where a private citizen or third party has any right to raise the issue. And those circumstances are legion. Um, I mean, there, I'll give you another great example that uh, you all may be very familiar with. Uh, one of the biggest areas in environmental law that gets a lot of attention is the so-called citizen suit. Uh, under many statutes, notably including federal environmental statutes, Congress created, through express statutory provision, a right for private citizens to bring an action in court if they allege that an industrial party is not complying with its permit or other regulatory standards. Absent Congress specifically writing those provisions, those private parties have no such right. They do not, if, if I am unhappy about the fact that I think some entity over here is violating its permit, I can pick up the phone and I can call the call Denrec and say, you got to get on these guys. They're violating this issue left and right. I can call them every day. If Denrec chooses not to act, if I don't have a citizen supervision right into the statute, I can call my legislative representatives. I can make lots of noise. I can call them. I don't have a right to go to court about it. Because the structure and scheme is regulatory agencies, administrative agencies, are created with the idea that that's their job. And only under certain circumstances do we create situations that second guess those agencies in the implementation of those jobs. And when it's done, it's done clearly and not in that circumstance. Any other questions? Yes, I'll follow up. Um, assuming an industry seeks a permit, an air permit, for example, could be an air permit, um, that would allow activities that um, if a status decision was made, would say that the Coastal Zone Act, um, it wasn't in compliance with the Coastal Zone Act. But that air permit was granted and there was no status decision made or no Coastal Zone um, permit request. Though in conflict with the Coastal Zone Act, what I understand you saying is that there's no jurisdictional authority for either either body, whether it's the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board or, or ourselves, to review that action. To me, that seems like a, a um, there's a loophole through the reg that if you don't request a status determination and you don't request a permit, 
Um, and the secretary doesn't make either one of those, that there's not an appealable path, even if the industry um, would have required it if one had been done. I would give several answers to that question. First, um, with respect to the secretary's responsibilities and authority, even in the absence of a specific request for status decision or permit application by any facility, if in the secretary and the department's judgment a facility is acting in a manner that's not compliant with the Coastal Zone Act, the secretary is the body that properly has the authority to pursue enforcement. And there is no question in any given circumstance, and, and I don't mean to change your hypothetical, I'm going to come back to it, but in a given circumstance, no air permits necessary. A facility is out there, it's a pre-existing facility, it simply takes it upon itself to start engaging in activity that somebody alleges violates the Coastal Zone Act. Those are the circumstances. They just decided, you know what, I'm going to go do this thing and I don't care what anybody says, I'm sure I can do it. They don't seek any kind of approval or authorization. Under that circumstance, there is no question that I don't have any right to go into court under law. I might make some tort claim and say that they're causing me property damage under tort law and and part of my argument is I think they're violating a statute, and that's it. But I don't have any right under the Coastal Zone Act to go in to bring an action for that circumstance. What I have the right to do is to call upon the authority, the agency that has that expertise, to call upon my elected officials and try to get something done. Once the secretary acts and brings an enforcement action, depending upon the scope, I may or may not have an ability to have some role in that context. The fact that you've now included in that process that this person sought and secured an air permit as, doesn't change the Coastal Zone Act analysis. That analysis remains the same, and that's exactly the issue and circumstance that we have in this situation. Um, we don't regard it as a loophole at all. A loophole would suggest that the only way to effectively implement this regulatory scheme is to create a right for third parties to engage in challenges before some tribunal of anything that they don't happen to think is appropriate under that statute. The concept of any complex environmental or any other regulatory statute is that there is an administrative agency established, many, many resources, to implement that statute and they have the expertise to do it. And it is only in limited circumstances that we are looking for a role for private citizens and third parties to raise an issue. Again, to be clear, that doesn't mean that if I'm being injured by what I perceive to be non-compliance, I don't have any rights. I can go to court and bring an action to say, in common, under common court law, to say, this person had a duty to me not to engage in that conduct. Because they did engage in that conduct, I've been injured, and I'm going to bring a claim. But I don't say, and the reason I'm doing it is because I have the ability to bring a claim under the coastal zone. That is the difference. Just clarification, this probably goes back to your summary of the jurisdiction, kind of where we are. They denied um, standing, so that's being appealed. I just want to be clear, if the Supreme Court reverses and says they do have standing, are you then jurisdictionally still, argue, or still arguing jurisdiction at the Coastal Zone Board? Where, where things stand now with respect to the Superior Court is that in addition to uh, the appeal raised by appellants on the standing issue, uh, both the refinery and the department have raised an appeal on the jurisdictional issue. So we believe that what will happen before the Superior Court is either the Superior Court will determine that the uh, Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board got it right on standing and the issue is properly disposed of on that basis, or if they disagree with the Coastal Zone Board's decision on standing, they should turn to the jurisdictional question that was raised and then seek to address it in that circumstance. So that's at the Superior, the jurisdiction issue of the Coastal Zone Board is with the Superior Court now yes. as stage two of their decision? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and again, I just, I do want to emphasize that we believe it to be very clear under the law that whatever ultimately the determination is about the jurisdiction of the Coastal Zone Board on these issues does not bear on your jurisdiction, nor should it. I mean, again, to think about, there's nothing that anybody could point to under the statute, law, or anything else that would suggest that somehow this board's jurisdiction is dependent on what that board's jurisdiction is. And the implementation of that it would be almost impossible if that were indeed 
case. So yes, that issue is up before the Superior Court. We expect that if it needs to get to it after it resolves the standing question, it will. But our view is it has absolutely no bearing on this court and what it needs to resolve. Do you know the status of where we are in the Superior Court? Um, I'll defer to Mr. Crystal if he's got any current news. The last we heard was You're smiling. Month. I'm smiling because we, we have sort of an unusual situation in, in that um, by rule, the uh, sheriff of Newcastle County is supposed to serve a precipice upon the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board to produce the administrative record to the Superior Court, so, and then all the briefing. And, and there appears to have been some kind of a breakdown at the sheriff's office, so that that service has not occurred. Um, and so what, what I have been pondering, and what I hope to, to work out with counsel sometime, either today or in the very near future, is a motion to the court to sort of prod that process forward. But right now, we're waiting for the administrative record to get to the Superior Court so that briefing can then begin. Thank you. 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 Thank you
I think I heard today, everyone says, of course, this board can hear appeals of air permits. But what Denrec and when the refinery want to do is they want to say, but there are limits on what you can hear, and those limits relate to the issues that are raised in the appeal. And so the question that you have to resolve in determining whether or not you have jurisdiction is what are the limits? Are there limits on your authority that are related to certain issues? What does the statute give you the power to do? And does that statute say, but you can't hear certain types of issues? And if we focus the analysis on in that way, I think you'll find that the arguments that are being made are not supported by the law. Your appellate authority arises because of section 6008. And I thought that since this is really a question about what does that section mean, it might make sense for everyone to have a copy of it. So I actually provided, I've made some copies for everybody. Here's a copy for everybody, including Frank on the board. jurisdiction arises out of section 6008A. What does it say? It says, quote, any person whose interest is substantially affected by any action of the secretary may appeal to the Environmental Appeals Board. So if a person is substantially affected by any action of the secretary, they have a right to appeal. That's what section 6008 says. Now just as important as to what it says is what it does not say. And there are two things that I think it does not say which are relevant to the motions here. First, this does not say that any person who's affected by an action of the secretary under Chapter 60 or the Environmental Control Act. That language is not in this section at all. Mr. Weldon says, well, that's okay, because look at the whole statute. And you know what? There's this language in Section 6005 which says the Secretary is supposed to enforce this chapter. So that's what action of the Secretary means. The problem is, is that Section 6000A is not so limited. In fact, it gives us a clue that Section 6000A is not limited to Chapter 60 issues. Look at Section 6008E. That section says, there shall be no appeal of a decision by the Secretary to deny a permit on any matter involving state-owned land, including subaqueous land, except an appeal shall lie on the sole ground that the decision was discriminatory and that the applicant, whose circumstances are like and similar to those of other applicants, was not afforded like and similar treatment. Section 6008E says that there is an appeal which exists on subaqueous land issues. Now in the reply briefs, uh, the parties, uh, I believe it was Denbrek, wanted to say, well, that was just capturing what had been a historic fact, which was that no appeal for denial of subaqueous land permits were allowed under the acts which existed prior to the time Chapter 60 was passed in 1973. Well, that's true, and that covers the first half of this. But the right to appeal when there's a claim of a discriminatory denial of a permit was brand new. So Bakelius land permits are governed by Chapter 72 of Title VII, a completely different chapter, a completely different statute. What Section 6000A is saying is this board's jurisdiction goes beyond Chapter 60 
type issues. It's right in the statute. So any action of the secretary is not limited to Chapter 60 issues or an action by the secretary under Chapter 60. The second thing that Section 6008A does not say is that the appeal is limited to certain types of issues arising. Right? The argument here is, well, because it's Coastal Zone Act issues, it doesn't fall within Chapter 6008A. But again, look at the statutory language. It's any action of the Secretary. It doesn't say any action of the Secretary, but only as to those issues that arise under Chapter 60, or any particular set of issues. It just says any action. And here again, Section 6008 gives us a clue that that's the right interpretation. And to figure that out, you have to look at Section 6008B and Section 6008C. Section 6008B and C reflect something that is in the Delaware Administrative Procedures Act. That is, there are two kinds of things that agencies do. They have case decisions and they issue regulations. And B and C talk about this board's ability to hear appeals related to case decisions, that's B, and regulations, that's C. Now look at the first sentence of Section 6008B and it says, whenever a final decision of the Secretary concerning any case decision, including but not limited to any permit or enforcement action, is appealed. And then the section says certain things that are going to happen in that kind of appeal. You're going to have a public hearing. Uh, the record that was before the Secretary is part of the record that will be before you. You have certain control over the evidence that's going to come in. It defines the burden of proof and it says what powers you have. Affirm, reverse, remand with instructions. That's what you can do in a case, in appeal of a case decision like a permit decision, which is what this is. Compare that to C, which is an appeal of regulations issued by the Secretary. And in particular, I want to focus on the second to the last sentence of this section. It's four lines up from the bottom. And what it says is, the quote, the board shall take due account of the Secretary's experience and specialized competence and of the purposes of this chapter in making its determination, end of quote. So when this board considers appeals of regulations, Section 6008C says you must focus on Chapter 60 issues, the purposes of this chapter. That's what that language means. But there's no such language in B, which gives this and talks about this board's ability to hear appeals of case decisions. There's no language saying you can only focus on Chapter 60 issues. There's no limit on what can be raised in an appeal of a case decision at all. What this tells you is that the General Assembly knew that if they want you to focus just on Chapter 60 issues, they know how to tell you to do it. They did it in 6008C. And we cited the case law in our brief which says that when a legislature puts language in one section but doesn't put it in another section of a statute, it intended that to mean something. It intended that to mean a difference. So what 6008 is telling you is that there is no limit on the issues that can be considered when it is an appeal of a case decision, like a permit decision, which is what is before you now. So the language of the section itself, which gives you your authority to hear appeals, doesn't contain any limitation that you can only have appeals of Chapter 60 issues. 
It doesn't contain any limitation that you can only consider issues arising under the air permit or whatever the program might be. The language itself doesn't create the limitations that Denrec and the refinery want you to set. In effect, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, take this language, any action of the secretary, and put limitations on it. Because we think it shouldn't be that broad. But that's not supported by what's in the statute. It's not supported by the principles of statutory interpretation when you look at what Section 6008A says. Really, the question that you have to answer in determining whether or not you have jurisdiction is the question of what that language in A means. Does it mean any action of the Secretary? Or does it mean only some actions of the Secretary? The refinery of Denmark want you to believe that it says only some. And I ask you to look at the language and say whether or not it really does say that. I think it does not. Now, with that statutory background then, I ask you to think about what this is about. This is an air permit. We have appealed an air permit. <coughs> so even if, and air permits are issued under Chapter 60, everybody agrees that. So even if there was some kind of limitation, even if you could somehow read into, into 6008, some limitation that, gee, this is only Chapter 60 stuff, well, we have a Chapter 60 permit here. And neither of the refinery of Denmark disputed that fact, but what they want to say is, well, no, it's just limited to issues, and when you have coastal zone act issues, you have to go someplace else. Number one, we just saw, that's not true based on the language of 6008. It's not limited. There's nothing in there which says that you're limited to what kinds of issues you're going to have. And secondly, even if you are somehow limited in the issues that you can consider, limited to issues that relate to the issuance of a permit, we have to deal with Section 11.6 of the regulations. Now, what Denmark and the refinery want you to do is to say, well, that, that, you can ignore that. You can ignore that because that's not important. That's not, well, let's see if I got the language right here. It defines what needs to be in an application. That's all it is. They try to minimize the importance of what 11.6 requires. But our brief gives you the language, the testimony of Secretary O'Mara, who said that it's part of the air permitting process that you have to think about compliance with other regulations and other compliance programs. Because that just makes sense. We don't want DENREC to be issuing permits that might be OK under the air program, but violate the Coastal Zone Act program. It's part and parcel that the air permit needs to have that. And it's not just an application requirement. It's a requirement of issuance of the permit itself. This appeal is an appeal which says that the decision of the secretary was erroneous because it violates section 11.6 of the regulation. That's in the statement of appeal. That's the focus that you can take. And the problem is that they haven't really rebutted that problem. They just say, well, but, but you know, you can't think about Coastal Zone Act issues. And that's the reason why 11.6 doesn't matter. But that's part and parcel of the regulatory process. And we think the regulatory process went haywire here because the secretary failed to consider these compliance issues. And that's why we want you to consider this issue on appeal. And it's squarely within the air permitting regulatory process. Now, the reason why they want you to ignore 11.6 is because of ocean port. So let's talk about ocean port. I read that case numerous times. I read it five times yesterday. I have searched that case over and over again for the language which says that, this, that the Supreme Court said this board cannot consider issues related to the Coastal Zone Act. 
as part of a permitting process. I can't find it. What Ocean Port does is it has three parts. I think Mr. Cassidy mentioned this. Roman numerals one, two, and three. Roman numeral one is the factual background. And in that factual background, you find out that there was a Coastal Zone Act status decision issued four years before the permits at issue in the appeal. And you find the complex history of that case. Roman numeral two deals with the parties. And it deals with two specific questions. Question number one is, does the plaintiff, does the appellant, Wilmington Stevedores, have standing? And then secondly, did Wilmington Stevedores erroneously file its appeal before this board instead of before the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board? That's exactly the same question that you have to decide today. Did Sierra and Delaware Audubon erroneously appeal to you? And then part three deals with the remand. Whether, you know, why the superior court didn't get it right in remanding the matter back to you. Well, what did the court say in section two about the party? And specifically, the answer to those two questions. Well, here's what it said. After a long, extensive analysis of standing law in Delaware, it says, at, quote, as a result, we conclude solely on standing grounds that Wilmington Stevedores could not pursue the appeal to the EAB or the Superior Court. This renders moot the question whether Wilmington Stevedores erroneously appealed to the Environmental Appeals Board rather than the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, end of quote. So as to the question of, were you the right board to appeal to? The court said that question's moot. We're not going to decide that question. Instead, we're going to throw this case out solely on standing grounds. Now, in Roman numeral three, the discussion about this remand back, I've looked for the language, and I can't find it. As a matter of fact, it's, it's somewhat cryptic in what the court says. Because what the court does do, I agree with Mr. Walton to the extent that the court says, you know, there are some differences between Chapter 60 and Chapter 70, the Coastal Zone Act. But after having that discussion, the court says the following language. And this is the only language that they could possibly hang their head on as to what, you know, that the court somehow says something about jurisdiction. Here's what the court says, quote, Notwithstanding the difference in the statutory schemes, however, it is perhaps hyper-technical to treat them in isolation. In order to determine the correct posture with regard to both Chapter 60 permits and CZA, Coastal Zone Act status, in the future, the Secretary should make the DENREX position clear on an applicant's CZA status. As we noted, the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board handles the appeals from decisions of the Secretary. Thus, a remand to the EAB in the posture of this case was erroneous regarding the determination of Ocean Port's CZA status. End of quote. That's it. That's all the court says on this issue. What does that mean? Well, the posture of the case was very unusual. You had a four-year-old Coastal Zone Act status decision that was out there. You have a ruling where the court says it's moot, so it's not going to decide the question of jurisdiction. What does this language mean? I don't know. I'm not sure. If it says anything about jurisdiction, what it says is the following. When the Secretary is issuing a Chapter 60 permit, it should also say something about Coastal Zone Act status. And that saying something about Coastal Zone Act status could be heard by the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board. If the refinery in Denrick really want to embrace Ocean Port, it's curious 
that they would ignore that language of Ocean Port, which seems to say the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board has jurisdiction over a decision about the status of a facility under the Coastal Zone in the context of a Chapter 60 permit. And yet they've moved saying there's no jurisdiction for the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, both before that board and now in the Superior Court. Ocean Port doesn't say you cannot hear these issues. At best, it says the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board can. But it certainly isn't dispositive. It certainly doesn't tell you what your jurisdiction is. As a matter of fact, what it said was, was filing the appeal before you correct? That's moot. We're not going to decide. So Ocean Port doesn't provide nearly the legal precedent or the legal support that they claim it does. And if anything, what it does is it underlies the fundamental problem here, which goes back to this idea which was raised by the questions of Mr. Cassidy. What's clear is that the Ocean Port Court thought that there should be some place that you could hear the Coastal Zone Act issues. But that's not what Denmark and the refinery are arguing. They're arguing there's no place. No one gets to hear this decision because in their interpretation of what the Coastal Zone Act requires, we haven't satisfied the jurisdictional requirement. And you can't hear it because in their interpretation, we haven't satisfied the jurisdictional requirement. And so I come back to the point that I made before. Why do you exist as a board? Why does the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board exist as a board? It's to review, it's to be a review, a check and a balance on the Secretary. And yet the position that both Denrec and the refinery are adopting here is one which says there is no check. So since they get to think of all these wonderfully uh, extreme examples of what would happen if any action of the Secretary really meant any action of the Secretary, let me engage in a similar type of consideration of extremes. Think about what a finding that this board has no jurisdiction and the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board has no jurisdiction means. It means that the Secretary can make statements in an air permit application about compliance with other programs. And under DENREC, and under the refinery's interpretation, you can't consider those issues. They have to be issues about the air permit itself. But certainly what the Secretary said about Coastal Zone Act status is going to bind the department. The department's going to operate as if the refinery is in compliance with the Act without anyone being able to review that decision. Is that what the system of administrative review established by the General Assembly is trying to do? I think not. Your taking jurisdiction is a step towards making sure that someone considers the merits. And look, I don't want, you know, Mr. Cassidy says, well, you could have, you know, two inconsistent results and you can have people, you know, filing uh, two proceedings. I filed two proceedings because there was a concern about the jurisdiction of the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board. But having filed two, my clients only get one decision on the merits. Frankly, if the refinery in Denrec were to drop its opposition, or its claim that there's no jurisdiction of the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, and I went on standing at the Superior Court, then what's going to happen is the case will get remanded back to the board and they'll have to make a decision on the merits. And my clients have to live with that decision. We're not asking for multiple opportunities. We're just asking for one shot. And the position that the refinery in Denmark want to say is, sorry, you don't get any shot. Now look, these are difficult questions. What does Ocean Port mean? What does any action of the secretary mean in the context 
of Section 6008 and all the other statutes that are involved. Does the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board have jurisdiction? Those are all difficult questions, which is why I indicated that I believe and requested that this board issue a stay. Because, as I indicated, if in fact I prevail at the Superior Court, then the merits of this case will be decided by the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board and you won't even have to conduct it here. And certainly the Superior Court will spell out the issues because frankly the ability, the fact that these two appeals were filed are going to be part and parcel of the Superior Court's analysis. By staying this matter, you can obtain the wisdom of the Superior Court's analysis before you proceed to try to answer those difficult questions. You have the inherent authority and the inherent power to control your docket and to stay this matter until that ruling comes down. And that is why we believe you should do it. Now, Mr. Walton says, well, you've got to have jurisdiction before you can stay. No. You don't, you have not yet determined whether or not you have jurisdiction, but you're hearing these motions. <clears throat> the fact that my clients filed an appeal under the statute means that you have the ability to at least hear this matter and figure out whether or not you're going to take it all the way to the merits. You can decide through your inherent power as an administrative court to wait and see what the Superior Court says before you make that decision. You don't have to figure out jurisdiction. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. And so I think if you are uncomfortable about these issues, not sure, want the guidance, then I strongly recommend that you issue a stand. Thank you. Break here. I think this is a good time. Does everybody break? Sure. Before we go for break, any questions for Mr. Crystal? Uh, will you be wanting to come back and ask questions of Mr. Crystal? Or do you oh. want to do the questions? Okay. We can do both. I mean, we can do either. I'm fine to wait 15 minutes to okay. ask questions. All right. I just want to make sure you weren't including questions. Oh, no. No. Not for Mr. Crystal. <laughs> Success would be that you know includes the decision on the merits. So no, no, no. Okay. So right. now everybody, we have, we take jurisdiction, and we take jurisdiction. Hear the case in the next couple of weeks, I guess. Um, and and you win the superior court case. Well, I think that if, if there's a decision on the merits here, what I what I would have to do is think about whether or not I want to withdraw the superior court because there will be a decision on the merits. Uh, what if you lose here then? Well, the, the, decision on the merits and you lose here. Is the Superior Court case to go to the um, Coastal Zone Board still alive? No, I, I, what, I, what I would consider doing, what I would probably do is seek to dismiss that case because you will have decided the, the merits and then whatever that decision is becomes the decision on the merits that my clients are seeking and then we deal with that decision. All in all, what, what, what we're seeking is a decision on the merits of the Coastal Zone of Compliance with the Coastal Zone Act issue. And 
whether that comes from this board or whether it comes from the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board, we just want to make sure that there's a decision on the merits. So if you go forward and issue a decision, then I think the pursuit, the continued pursuit on the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board side is no longer necessary. But do you think the right place for this to be decided is the Coastal Zone Board? Well, that's what I said in, in the statement of, of uh, appeal. And, and, you know, I think that they should have the shot at it because they're, um, you know, they, they are the people who focus on these issues certainly more than you do. Uh, but uh, a decision on the merits is, is ultimately what my clients seek, and whether it's in this, before this board or the other one, um, I think is less important to us. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it just, it's avoiding the, you, by, by your position, you seem to say you have the right to have this heard on the merits in both places, and then pick the decision you like best. No, no. I have to live with whatever is the first decision on the merits. One. Well, basically because I think it's probably race judicata in the other manner. But aren't we, are we in separate, are we living in separate silos? Well, you're, you, you may be in separate silos, but I would be bound by the legal conclusions that were reached by whoever makes the decision on the merits first. So I think from a race judicata standpoint, I couldn't ask for a second decision. That's why I think the notion of inconsistent uh, decisions probably is... is uh, a theoretical and not an actual threat because I can't I can't seek two decisions with one decision already having been made. At least that's my view. Um, are you aware of any other environmental appeals board um, appeals that were heard on the merits that dealt specifically with? Um, the determination of a permitting, environmental permitting action, compliance with other regulations. Uh, I am not. I'm not. Thank you. If we if we deny jurisdiction, I don't. Can you merge your appeals so that you are now sending up to the superior court our denial and their denial and saying where do we go? Yeah, that's certainly what I would seek to do. Yes. can't be based upon uh, whether or not another body can hear the appeal. Jurisdiction is based upon whether you can hear the appeal. And again, I go back to Oceanport. And my friend and, uh, talked that he didn't understand the Oceanport decision. I'd like, I'd like to maybe help out with that just a little bit. <coughs> Please Please the, three. If you, you have to read, just like you have to read the statutes as a whole, or the statutory scheme as a whole, you need to read Oceanport as a whole. And when you read Oceanport as a whole, first you have to look at this board's decision. If you read this board's decision, um, and I'm just quoting from the Superior Court's opinion, because that's what I have here. With respect to issues related to Coastal Zone Act, the opinion, that speaking of this board's opinion, includes the following statement. The entire thrust of the WS. Uh, complaint clearly indicates that the complaint belonged before the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board and not the board. That, and if you recall, they're making the same arguments that they're making here, that even though it was a, a subaqueous land permit and a NIPTES permit, that this board had jurisdiction. And the board denied uh, jurisdiction. They said they had no jurisdiction. On, or, <clears throat> and it was also based upon standing grounds, but there was no jurisdiction found. And the Superior Court decision Again, it came up with a phrase which is quoted in the uh, Supreme Court opinion. They said, 
quite naturally, the Environmental Appeals Board considers it beyond the scope of its authority to review the CZA determination. So that's what the Superior Court did. And if you look at the entirety of the Supreme Court opinion, if you go right at the very beginning, right before Part 1, right, um, the court said, the issue of standing is one of first impression, as is the scope of the of the EAB's jurisdiction in matters pertaining to the CZA. So that's what the court was deciding, right? And then what the court said is, with regard to the remand to consider the CZA status issues, the Superior Court confused the application of CZA found in Title 7, Chapter 70 of the Delaware Code to the issuance of permits granted under the authority of Chapter 1672. Accordingly, we reverse. So it says, uh, there's a different steps toward a mechanism. And if you go over actually two page or four page two, the court again discusses what the EAB and the Superior Court's holding were with regard to jurisdiction. And if you go all the way to the end of the opinion, there's a key phrase in what uh, Mr. Crystal uh, read to it to the board, right? And, and, and he talks about the last paragraph, the one that starts with notwithstanding. And, the, and if you read that, it says, as we noted, the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board handles the appeals from the decisions of the secretaries in 7 Bell Code 7007. The as we noted refers to the beginning of the opinion and the recitation of the opinion of this board in the Superior Court. So I think the decision is fairly clear that there is no ultimate uh, jurisdiction. And with respect to Preston, even if there's a question of what Ocean Port, the Supreme Court decision held, this board set precedent so they wouldn't hear coastal zone issues. And the Superior Court set that same precedent. So, with respect to statutory construction, this board um, has to read the statutes as a whole, not isolated parts of them. And if you go to the threads of the Delaware Supreme Court jurisprudence, for the last dozen or so years, they say, look, what, is, what are we trying to do? We're trying to achieve the intent of the General Assembly based upon the words that are written. So, and we try to harmonize statutes whenever possible. Those are three key uh, interpretive ways that we look at a statute. And I will submit that, um, that a very isolated reading of 6008, where, where we take the phrase, any action of the secretary. And I, I believe that it was stated by my friend, Mr. Crystal, that, that there would be no limitation on issues if any action of the secretary could be appealed. And the point is very simple. If you allow, even in this case, CZA issues to be appealed to this board under the phrase, any action of the secretary, and you interpret that so broadly, that means you will be able to hear an appeal of anything and all the evils I said would happen. It's not just this case, go for it. You would have forum shopping, you would have duplicative arguments, you would have duplicative appeals. I'm not saying Mr. Crystal would bring those duplicative appeals, but certainly that opens the door, the camel's nose under the tent. And it's an absurd result if you look at it at, in totality because you have the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board that's here to hear issues of coastal zone when it's within their jurisdiction. So the point is ultimately, don't let the camel get under the tent because you don't know what that's going to happen in the future. And ultimately, if you take any action of the secretary the way it's properly read, it's properly read under 6005, and you have an appeal of the secretary's enforcement of the chapter 60 requirements. I'd like to, uh, um, Mr. Holden and Mr. Aronson, I'd like to address the point that you raised, and I, I think the sense is it's unfair uh, if there's no right to an appeal. I think that's what you were, you were getting at uh, when you were asking questions of folks. There may not be an administrative appeal with respect to Coastal Zone Act issues in this case, but that does not mean that there are not other remedies, and I will give you a few. First, there is always the remedy of a mandamus action to compel a government official to perform an act. 
So you always have the remedy of mandamus that can go there. Um, there's also <coughs> the remedy, uh, uh, various AGs and for, uh, attorney general enforcement provisions under the Coastal Zone Act, which are independent of the secretary. And also, if there was a question about someone had done something wrong under the Coastal Zone Act, um, under, under Coastal Zone Act Regulation 7.5, the secretary can at any time, if he suspects activity uh, violates the Coastal Zone Act, they can request an applicant bring the status decision. So there are a number of ways where if there's behavior, it's just not like it's not reviewable. The bottom line is you have provisions, um, citizen ways that you can go through. Again, there's no inherent right to an administrative appeal. There's lots of administrative actions where there is no appeal. And simply because there may not be, if there is not an available appeal to this board, and there may not be one to the Coastal Zone Board, does not mean that that creates jurisdiction in this board, ultimately. You don't have the right to have it always heard somewhere. So, um, with respect to the stay, if you issue a stay without deciding the jurisdictional question first, you're doing exactly what the Ocean Report Court said. We can't I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been That's trying right. to lead forward. <laughs> lead forward. <laughs> um, with respect to the stay question, the Ocean Report says it said that this court or this board cannot exercise a little bit of jurisdiction to remand things back to the secretary. And if you don't have jurisdiction from the start, you can't take on that authority. And if you need to decide whether or not you have jurisdiction first, and then decide any state questions, because without jurisdiction, you cannot act. So ultimately, in summary, I think under Ocean Board, under the plain statutory schemes, as you look at what the statutes provide and the meaning of their intent, there is, the appellants have not met the burden of establishing jurisdiction. Are there any questions? Under, under environmental, uh, under Chapter 60, an environmental permit, does, does the Secretary of the Department um, have the obligation to consider the permitting action and whether it is in compliance with, with other regulations that are outside of Chapter 60? Yeah. Yeah. The answer to that is, the answer to that is yes. Um, and, and the Department would contend that they considered compliance within the Coastal Zone Act, um, that, that this permitting action was not in conflict with the Coastal Zone Act regulation. That's the plan review of the Secretary's order. And, and just let me be clear on how that came up. There were issues. The Secretary didn't need to address that as part of his, his order. Se if you think about it, the Secretary only had to address the air permit. But kind of to make sure that the public, is, through its public concerns that were raised, so he addressed it as part of his order. And, and that's the reason uh, it was stated. It, it, is it then in the, in the purview of the Environmental Appeals Board, is it within the jurisdiction of the Environmental Appeals Board to ensure that that check has been done? That is, this permitting action in compliance with other regulations? No, that, because it's not under your statutory provision. Even though it's within an air permit, it's strictly a Coastal Zone Act issue. Um, and, and, and if we have, you could come up with some other facts, but ultimately, if you if you look at this case, especially under the plain language of the appeal that they filed, they said this is only a Coastal Zone Act issue. It has nothing to do with the jurisdiction of this board. And sort of the camel under the camel's nose under the tent theory, if you took it on that theory and you could just appeal anything at all, anytime the Coastal Zone Act was mentioned in anything, then the appeal would come to this board and that would subvert the plain intent of the General Assembly. And, and under, and, and I, I see there's there's different stages of that analysis. You know, there are, uh, was that consideration made? Is this permitting action in compliance with other regs or in conflict with other regs? And then there's a further level of analysis of, of what would that action be if there was action required under another regulation? And, and so you're saying that the department would say that it's not our jurisdiction to um, review whether that review of conflict with other regs was made at all. 
that's great. It's not it's not your jurisdiction, it's just very simply mm -hmm. to sort of go into that coastal zone act analysis. Not the analysis of the coastal right. zone, but whether that analysis was done at all. Well, whether the analysis was done at all. I, I, I'm thinking through that question. I'm sure you might have an opportunity to take a look at whether there was analysis done, but whether or not you could decide it, which is exactly what the appellant said. Those are two separate questions. Yeah, two separate questions. Whether or not you could decide it, I'm very confident on the answer. You <laughs> can't decide that question because it's not within your statutory jurisdiction. But whether it's within our jurisdiction to hear was the analysis done? Yeah, and in this case, it, I think there's a record that's pretty clear that that analysis. I understand that. In another case, yeah, probably. Yeah, you, could, you could ask the question. Things we get taught in law school and things that we learn as we practice for a while. And one of the things that we learn when we're practicing before a forum is a good question to always try to pose to that forum or a good way to characterize another side's position is they are trying to limit your authority. They're trying to tell you what you can't do. Um, and that's precisely what Mr. Crystal is trying to do. Characterize our positioning as in essence attempting to limit the scope of your authority. We are trying to ensure your expertise is being dedicated and directed to the places it was intended by the legislature, most importantly to be consistent with the jurisdictional standard. The other thing Mr. Crystal is trying to do is to frame the question in a way that makes it seem much more complicated. He has sought to make this to be a question about, do I have a forum any place? With all due respect, that question is not before this board. The only question before this board is whether or not this board has jurisdiction. As a practical and factual and legal matter, whether or not any entity may or may not have jurisdiction is being considered and necessarily must be considered by other entities. So when you're evaluating this question, whatever your particular thoughts are about the implications for that answer as it relates to other issues is not the question that you must answer as much as Mr. Crystal would like to frame it that way. And indeed, as a factual and practical matter, you can't even know because of the separate proceedings that are going on elsewhere. And also, when we've got a case that seems to be not very helpful to us, the best way to address it is to say, it's really complicated. I don't know what it means. The best thing you can do is punt. Avoid the issue altogether. Let somebody else deal with it. It's always inviting to be asked or suggested don't deal with it. Let somebody else deal with it. My own experience is when a lawyer tells you, I don't know what that case means, that means I can't figure out a way to make it help me. Um, because there is no interpretation of Ocean Port that can mean anything different than what we're presenting. I want to address very specifically some of the points that Mr. Crystal raises because I think they're quite important to this board's decision here. First, with respect to the statutory issues in Section 6008, I thought it really interesting and, and uh, noteworthy that Mr. Crystal distributed a piece of paper that included Section 6008 and 6008 alone. And his specific recommendation was we need to look at 6008A and don't listen to what Mr. Walton tells you to look at the rest of the statute. Look at 6008A, but, but look at B and C too, because I think B and C helps me. So the whole concept of statutory construction is not we look at those portions of the statute that we think are consistent with our argument. It is necessary to look at the entire statute. And let's look at 6008C. Mr. Wal uh, excuse me, Mr. Crystal's analysis is predicated on the idea that A is unknown. Any person whose interest is substantially affected by any action of the secretary. And then he uses C as a basis to say, but look at C, it's different. C specifically includes, later in the paragraph, the board shall take due account of the secretary, I'm sorry, that's a relevant sentence, um, in specifically focusing on the purposes of this chapter and of the purposes of this chapter in making its determination. Well, the beginning of 6008C doesn't talk about regulations promulgated under this chapter. It says appeals of regulations shall be on the record before the secretary. And then goes on to include in that paragraph statement to say make sure you consider the purposes of this chapter. Taking the analysis together would mean 
Well, those regulations can't be limited to regulations under this chapter because it doesn't say that in the first sentence. It says regulations. So if the analysis is it's not limited, that means that's not limited either. So when you interpret regulations under any statute, you're being directed to take into account the purposes of Chapter 60. It doesn't make sense, and it can't make sense. And the principal point of statutory construction is you need to look at everything together to try to make sure together it all makes sense. And here, that directly points to the very issue we're raising. Mr. Crystal doesn't address the fact in his comments we've got subsequent statutes that specifically grant jurisdiction to this board in specific areas. Completely unnecessary if this broad grant of authority went to every issue. He tries to anticipate and address the idea that we can all engage in extreme examples. They're necessary outcomes. Under that reading, if we are all to read, any action of the secretary means exactly that. But that means when the secretary is out speaking about any issue, a reporter comes up to the secretary, asks a question, he makes a comment on a given issue. That's an action of the secretary. I want to appeal that to this board. The secretary fires somebody. I've been aggrieved. I've been fired. It's an action of the secretary. I want to appeal to this board. Heck, the secretary backed into my car on the way here today. It's an action of the secretary. I want to appeal to this board. Now, the point may be we can go through various ways to try to say, well, no, it doesn't include that, and, and here's a way to get there. But the language in Section 6008A doesn't get us there. And the very point that we have to emphasize for these purposes are the se sentence can't mean what appellants say it means for all the reasons that were identified. <laughs> Mr. Crystal also talks about the fact that, well, look, look what happened in this case. The specific action of the secretary in issuing the order includes all these statements about the specific interpretation of the Coastal Zone Act. And whatever that is, it's going to bind what the department does. Well, every time the secretary gives direction to his or his staff and to the department in general, that's going to dictate what the, separate, what the department does, what the individual groups do. That doesn't mean that every one of those points of direction become a final agency action that gives rights to an appeal. They are all actions of the secretary that bear upon the interpretation and implementation of the regulatory programs that are within the purview of the department, but unequivocally do not create rights of appeal to this body. And if they did, you would never have an opportunity to address those issues that were truly important and meaningful. Let me turn now to the issue of the regulation. Uh, Mr. Crystal suggests that we want to ignore the regulation. I can find I, it for can I interrupt? Yes, sir. Let's go back to the point you were making before. I'm a legislator. I have ocean board in And I'm drafting legislation on air, solid waste, whatever it might happen to be. But I've had this. Wouldn't I be inclined to put something in that says, and the Environmental Bill of Board shall have jurisdiction over appeals of decisions by the Secretary? Wouldn't I be inclined to put that in instead of leaving it out? If the legislature wanted to ensure that this board had jurisdiction over coastal zone issues, certainly, subsequent to Ocean Port, you would think the legislature would have made an express statement to that effect. Our position is, even without Ocean Port, the legislature would have needed to make an express statement to that effect, especially given the fact that we've got two bodies, the Coastal Zone Board and an Environmental Appeals Board. Yeah, I'm having a job giving much of the way of credence to a statement in legislation in the future, assigning responsibility, uh, be, being something that really doesn't add anything, or on the other hand, takes away uh, jurisdiction in other issues. Uh, are you speaking specific to coastal zone issues or relative to the other statutory provisions we've been discussing? Just, just the idea that the statutory provision was made in the future uh, uh, reduces the breadth of the scope. Oh, I think the argument we're advancing in that respect, Mr. Woods, is a little different. What we're basically saying is that if the intent of Section 6008A was to broadly grant to this board jurisdiction to consider any action of the Secretary whatsoever, then subsequent statutory enactments, many of which, by the way, were pre motion board, um, specifically saying this board shall have jurisdiction as it relates to these specific issues under this statute is completely unnecessary. And there's no suggestion by appellants or otherwise that somehow Section 6008A has 
been re rewritten or revised since its enactment in any event. So Ocean Port is not suggesting to have changed the language of that provision. I think what we're arguing is subsequent enactments by the legislature, both pre- and post-Ocean Port, in specifically identifying what this board's jurisdiction is, makes no sense if you read that provision to say the board has jurisdiction over it. You don't need to grant further jurisdiction if that's true. Okay, just moving on from Mr. Holden. The secretary should consider on a firm that other environmental factors. I think we've agreed on that, right? Well, I think what we've agreed on, sir, is that the regulation, and it's important to note that it is a regulation, provides for the secretary to consider compliance and consistency with other environmental statutes administered by the department. That's and what the provision says. If the secretary says. does that, he's addressing other issues, and he makes a decision. Is that decision reviewable by this board? What we would state, sir, is that any activity of the secretary that, uh, by regulation or otherwise, that would involve some level of review that's not granted to this board by statutory direction cannot be the basis of jurisdiction. So the secretary cannot promulgate a regulation to establish a new form of jurisdiction for this board where the statute itself doesn't create it. Jurisdiction, the secretary is required to address in his decision, in a decision on other, any issue, other regulations in other areas compared to him. If he's required to do that and he makes a decision that it doesn't apply, is it appealable to us that it does? I would submit that it's not, sir, that the determination as to whether or not specific to this case that the application of the Coastal Zone Act to this air permit is not appealable to you, whether or not the secretary considered its relevance in the context of issuing the air permit, because it relates to a substantive interpretation of the Coastal Zone Act, the jurisdiction of which is solely vested in the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board. And I do want to spend another minute on that regulatory issue, if I might, because, as I mentioned, we are clearly not ignoring the provision. And in characterizing its appeal, Mr. Crystal, or their appeal, excuse me, Mr. Crystal suggests that appellants relied on this regulatory provision of Section 11.6. The only reference to the regulation occurs at the end of the allegations in one place within the appeal. And in that context, it is a C example, Delaware Administrative Code referenced Section 11.6. So the suggestion is if somehow this air permit appeal is steeped in this regulatory provision, and that has been the intent from appellants from the outset, is not in any way borne out by what the appeal says. Uh, it's a passing reference to the regulation. Our point ultimately as it relates to these issues are any determination about what the scope and effect of that regulation is and means for purposes of jurisdiction has to be interpreted within the bounds of the statutory grant of jurisdiction. It cannot be a vehicle to create a new regulatory, a new jurisdictional scheme over any kind of regulatory action of the secretary or otherwise. Um, and we have been very clear about addressing that throughout these issues. As it relates to Ocean Port, I don't want to reiterate things that Mr. Walton's already covered. I would suggest to you, however, that the confusion articulated by Mr. Crystal, in our view, was not in any way borne out by the language of the opinion itself. And, and it really starts with his characterization of Roman numeral two. Mr. Crystal would suggest Roman numeral two deals with standing and jurisdiction, and then Roman numeral three just deals with the ringing. The very first sentence of Roman numeral two is uh, deals with the issue surrounding standing itself. And the language the court uses are, we first address the question whether WSI has standing in this case. It's the opening sentence of Roman numeral two. The entire discussion under Roman numeral two addresses the standing issue. Having made that opening sentence in the beginning of Roman numeral two, the court goes on in the beginning of Roman numeral three to say, subsequent to the footnote upon which Mr. Crystal puts a lot of reliance, Thus, we turn to the question whether the Superior Court correctly remanded the case to the EAB, which was then directed to remand the matter to the Secretary of Denmark for a review of the status of Ocean Port's pro project under the CZN. 
So the suggestion that the court didn't really get to the jurisdictional question, two and three dealt with those issues together, and three was a remand. It's not what the case says. It's not what the language of the case says. And Mr. Walton has already pointed your attention to the ultimate <coughs> final statements of the court as it relates to the jurisdictional issue, standing directly for the proposition, not that somebody must have the opportunity to review these issues, but that the Coastal Zone Board is the body that has that opportunity solely to address these issues, if any does. Relative to the very issues we talk about in terms of the implications of these determinations um, and some of the questions that have been posed about where this goes, this, the ultimate issue becomes here, is any number of permutations on where these cases and proceedings may go. Ultimately, one scenario is positive. What happens if you win on the merits? Well, there's all manner of opportunities for who wins and what issues and in what circumstances, what appeals may be filed further as to those issues. And so we can end up with, quite contrary to Mr. Crystal's characterization, continuous dual proceedings going on until there's finally an ultimate resolution on the issue. The real point here becomes, and when we look at the way in which the issues that Mr. Crystal is raising do come down to, they ultimately all point truly to the question of, does the Coastal Zone Board have jurisdiction here? The appellate's appeal makes clear they believe it should be there. The arguments they make go to the ultimate issue of, and the specific comments even at the outset of today's um, arguments that Mr. Crystal made in describing the posture of the case, describe the action by the secretary as a decision that the secretary made, which was fundamentally equivalent to a Coastal Zone Act status decision. That is the position of the appellants. And the question then is one, in the bounds of the Coastal Zone Board's jurisdictional issue. Is that right? Is this fundamentally equivalent to a status decision under the Coastal Zone Act? And if so, wouldn't that mean the Coastal Zone Act, the Coastal Zone Board would have jurisdiction? Those issues are out and being addressed in that forum. Those are not questions for this board to address, and that ultimately is what, as a fallback, Mr. Crystal is asking you to do. He's ultimately saying, I'm not sure how that's going to come out and how those issues are going to resolve in the context of that Coastal Zone Act proceeding, they ultimately go to whether or not the Coastal Zone Board has jurisdiction here. But the implications being that since they might not, and that's uncertain, the fallback should be that this board does. Mr. Crystal started his comments with the statement of, what is the purpose of this board? And he did say, but quickly passed over, and what is the purpose of the Coastal Zone Board? The real question has to be asking those questions in tandem. What is the purpose of having two boards? And what those two boards serve? And what issues those boards are to address? Whether or not the activity in which the Secretary engaged in discussing in response to comments the relevance of the Coastal Zone Act and the compliance with it, whether that is an appealable action under the Coastal Zone Act is an issue to be resolved as to the jurisdiction of the Coastal Zone Board. We do not in any way take away from the position we take. Absolutely not. They should not have jurisdiction. We believe we're right. We may be proven to be wrong. That isn't really ultimately that this board resolves that question. This board only has to ask the question of, does the Environmental Appeals Board have that jurisdiction? And none of the arguments being advanced suggest they do, with the exception of the any action of the Secretary, which as we demonstrated, doesn't support any reasonable, not as absurd interpretation of the ultimate requirements of these issues. I have to then turn to the stay that Mr. Crystal has requested, and again, as I suggested a few moments ago, uh, it often is a nice invitation to say, hey, you can just avoid this issue by staying in. First of all, there are express legal standards that govern any circumstance of the stay, and the appellants have made no showing that that is met here. The refinery is prejudiced every day that any uncertainty looms over the validity of its ongoing operations and the continued perpetuation of these proceedings has direct adverse bearing on the refinery. The only thing that appellants point to in favor of a stay is avoiding the question and maybe being able to get a different answer before we have to get to it. That is not a balance of the benefits and harms that can possibly justify a stay in these circumstances. We also would submit that the manner in which the issue has been raised before the board is completely improper to the extent that a stay was sought that it should have been by way of motion to give the opportunity for the parties to address it. Instead, 
as the stipulation that has been reviewed by this board reflected, when we looked at the pre-hearing pre proceedings that we addressed, we specifically determined we weren't going to seek a stay. And to have it be raised at the last moment, to basically be right before, the, in the context of a response brief, um, that that would be a procedural vehicle that appellants would pursue, again, strictly for the purpose of, I'd like to keep this on the back shelf. Most importantly, as it relates to the stay, there is absolutely no bearing on what the Superior Court is deciding about this court's jurisdiction. The questions before the Superior Court, the questions the Superior Court will answer are, do the appellants have standing before the Coastal Zone Board to raise the issues they've raised? And if the answer to that is, the Coastal Zone Board was wrong, they have standing, then does the Coastal Zone Board have jurisdiction? The only way that has any bearing on this board's considerations is if somehow there was a legitimate argument that said the question of your jurisdiction is linked to the Coastal Zone Boards. There is absolutely nothing under any statutory, regulatory, or other legal provision that establishes and supports that. And it can't be. The very question of jurisdiction cannot be dependent upon whether or not the separate board does. And that's all the Superior Court will address. Should this board decide that the, the appellants don't have, or rather that the board has no jurisdiction, as we believe is necessary here, um, then as has been discussed, the issues may be addressed by the Superior Court to resolve, and that really is the only forum in which that can occur. Short of that, the proceedings before this board necessarily are going on in parallel. The outcome of those proceedings necessarily give rise to separate opportunities, whether they're pursued, no one can say, of further proceedings to appeal, et cetera, on a separate path. Um, that, the current circumstance, a justification for a state cannot be identified. The burdens on the parties do not justify them. In fact, they fully support proceeding with all due haste for the benefit of the refinery. Um, and there is not in any way been an appropriate opportunity for the board to even consider the question to have it framed properly before um, as it relates to appropriate legal argument and analysis. In the end, all of this comes down to one question. And that is, in interpreting a question that arises under the Coastal Zone Act, what is the intended forum for those questions? Does that mean that that forum will hear and resolve every question that ever arises? No, absolutely not. But because there are limits and bounds, that's what the concept of jurisdiction is all about. It is necessarily setting limits. Because absent that, no tribunal, no court, no administrative body can possibly function because there's no limits on the flood of potential challenges that are raised before its doors. That's what jurisdiction is all about. And that is clear in this circumstance that as it relates to the Coastal Zone Act, as interpreted by Ocean Port, as reflected in legislative determination, those interpretations are solely before the Coastal Zone Board. Whether the board looks at them in this case is to be decided by other bodies and has no bearing on the decision as to whether you should be looking at the same questions. Any questions? Let me start with the issue of the stay, which was the last point of Mr. Cassidy. First, the refinery claims prejudice. Well, prejudice exists because the refinery and Denver have chosen to fight in every way, shape, and form to avoid a decision on the merits of this case. They challenge the jurisdiction of the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board. They challenge the standing. And now they challenge the jurisdiction of this board. If they had not challenged those issues before the board uh, back in July, the Coastal Zone Industrial Control Board would have made a decision on the merits. We wouldn't even be here. The notion that somehow there's uncertainty being created by this process going forward is an uncertainty that the refinery itself has created by its decision to fight this thing on every level except or until all other avenues are exhausted and we have to actually face up to the merits of this decision. The prejudice is solely created by that. Now, in my brief, I argued what the standards are and what the requirements are. And I showed that there are, that this meets the general recognized requirements 
and why there is a benefit to be gained by this board of being able to allow the Superior Court to provide some clarity on these issues. And the issues are not just related to the jurisdiction. There are going to be factual issues that have to be dealt with. It seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that if, in fact, the Superior Court finds that there is standing for my clients, that makes the standing issue here a lot easier, if not conclusively established. There are factual findings which the Superior Court will make, which would streamline any hearing that this board holds. There are benefits to be gained by letting the Superior Court issue its ruling. And, there's, and the only prejudice that exists on the other side is a prejudice that was self-created. Now, the other point that was raised was this issue of the stipulation of the parties. And that the stipulation somehow precludes a stay from being entered by this board. In the process of negotiating that stipulation, the parties exchanged drafts, had conversations. I believe the refinery's brief talks about phone conversations that took place. But when the drafts started to circulate, they circulated by email. And I have an email that I would like to share because I think it's important to this issue. Again, I've got copies for the board and for Mr. Broges. Now, you know, the way with, with emails, they, they run in reverse chronological order, so the most recent email is the one on top, but I want to start with the one at the bottom of the first page of the handout. That's an email that I sent on October 23rd, and I sent it to all counsel involved. The text of my, my email is at the top of the second page. And I said, I've reviewed the latest draft. That's the latest draft of the stipulation. And I stated, quote, my one concern about the previous drafts is that our stipulation appeared to be ordering the EAB to do certain things. The addition of a signature line for the board chair to sign partially addresses that issue. But I am concerned that the stipulation slash order might be read as precluding the board from staying the matter on its own motion, or perhaps a motion by a party, something that Frank appeared to want to leave open as a possibility. I specifically raised the issue that the stipulation was, you know, I was concerned that it would somehow prevent a stay by this board or by somebody filing a motion. And I concluded. You know, I'm CCing Frank on this email, as he does not appear to be in the previous email chain, to get Frank's read. If Frank believes that the stipulation order leaves the board the flexibility to stay the matter, then I am okay with it. If Frank believes it does not, then we need to rework it. I did not want to sign the stipulation if the stipulation precluded some kind, precluded the board from being able to stay this matter. Now, the email was sent to Mr. Cassidy, it was sent to all counsel. Did anybody say, oh no, the stipulation prevents the board from being able to issue a stay? It prevents a party from being able to file a motion for a stay or to ask for a stay. No. Instead, the response, which is at the top of the first page, came 34 minutes later from Ms. Picaro, who's, who's co-counsel with Mr. Cassidy. What Ms. Picaro said was, quote, because we are proposing the stipulation of the parties, such stipulation, whether adopted by the board or not, could not limit the board's authority to act in any manner in the context of this proceeding. Close quote. That's why I signed the stipulation, because it reserved for you the ability to stay this man. Two other points that I want to deal with that were raised uh, by the refinery and, and, and by Mr. Uh, by Denver. First, the argument seems to be, and I, I especially enjoy the idea of the Secretary's car backing into someone as becoming the basis for an appeal, that any action of the Secretary opens the doors for all kinds of things to be before this board. But the reality of the situation is, is that this board is bound by the Delaware, Delaware Administrative Procedures 
And that act recognizes two kinds of things that agencies do and that you review. One are case decisions and one are regulations. They're covered in 6008B and 6008C. Backing the car into someone else is not a case decision. It's not the issuance of a regulation. There are already mechanisms that exist which take away some of these extreme examples that they want to point you to. And my argument is not that this board has jurisdiction over everything. My argument is that Section 6008A contains none of the supposed limitations on this board's jurisdiction that Denrec and the refinery want you to say it has. There's no language in there which says it's limited to actions under Section, under Chapter 60. Now, again, the point is raised, well, what about Section 6005? But what Section 6008E says is, you know what, you also have jurisdiction over subaqueous land stuff, right? It expands it. Section 6008B says no limitation on considerations of Chapter 60 issues. What the language any action of the Secretary says is that it can't be limited to, in this way of there are only certain issues that you can think about. That's my point about 6000A. And that's a point that hasn't really been responded to. Again, what does that language mean? Does it mean any action? Or does it mean only some action? That's ultimately what this comes down to. The other point that I wanted to respond to was uh, the point that uh, Mr. Walton made about, you know, there are other remedies available. We could go file a mandamus action. Or the Attorney General can engage in its own enforcement of the Coastal Zone Act, separate and apart from anything the Secretary may do. And the Secretary can request that somebody file a status decision. Well, the only one of those remedies that the Sierra Club or the Delaware Audubon could possibly engage in was a mandamus proceeding. And that's simply saying, you know what, you don't hear it, let the courts deal with it. It doesn't say that um, <coughs> we can't, uh, or, or rather, I guess what I should say is that what it basically does is it says, go engage in this other kind of activity instead of coming to you in the language that 6000A says, we're allowed to come to you for. Again, you exist to review the actions of the Secretary. And the question is whether or not we're going to limit that by saying, well, but you can't hear certain types of issues based upon a very narrow reading of the language of 6008A that's not supported by Section 6008 itself. That's, I think, what this ultimately comes down to. As to the rest of the issues, I'll stand on my feet. Thank you.
I move to grant Denrex and DCRC's motion to dismiss the appeal for lack of subject matter jurisdiction.